So in Colossians chapter 1, now if you have a really good memory, and if you can go back three years and remember everything I said about this first lesson, my wife gave me extreme confidence that they don't remember a thing that you said. <laughs> <laughs> which is probably true. <laughs> but if, if you are like that, then this will be a good refresher for you. But uh, if you're not, then it'll be, it'll be all new. Uh, so, Lord willing, we're, we're going to start a, a lesson on the book of Colossians. I want to do a book study. It's not a long book, but there's a lot packed in it. Not going to hurry. Just as far as we get at the time allotted, that's where we're going to stop. And there is no, it's, it, it's not a race to get to the end. It's not a race to get through a verse. If we get through, I mean, I, the first lesson goes through the first eight verses. I don't know if we'll even get that far. I don't know, but let's just uh, see where we go. And just so you know, lest you think I go off on a rabbit trail, for all you people that hunt, bear season and deer season run at the same time, okay? Rabbit and squirrel run at the same time. So both are in season. I might be deer hunting, but a big bear comes across my path, it's in season, okay? So it's not a rabbit trail. It's not unconnected. It's in season, okay? That's my disclaimer. Well, let's, let's look at Colossians, and I'm just going to give you some fa some, just some facts for you to keep in your mind. A lot of times it helps us to understand what we're talking about. Like when I was talking to Christy and Raymond the one day when uh, Schwenke was here, and he was talking about these little animals that can go up the side of the cliff. It's almost like they got suction cups on their feet. They actually saw him in person, these things. So it helped them through his message to have been in Israel and see these animals that he was talking about. And uh, I actually saw a, a, a thing online where they showed one of these things climbing up a dam, like a dam like this. And it, it was just amazing. Uh, maybe something like that. Yep, it had a different name. Yeah, it's, it's almost like they had suction cups on their feet. Well, you know, they saw, they, they saw the land over there in Israel. They saw what the train looked like. They saw all these things. So it helped them to better visualize the evangelist when he was talking about it. Well, I'm giving you some of these, these things just so you have an idea of what the layout of the land was and who these people are that we're talking about. And some of these things I didn't know. Now, when you think of the land where Colossae is, was, you have, and you know, we all know Ephesus. We all hear about um, uh, La Laodicea. Well, if, if I'm looking at the map in front of me, you're going to see it backwards, but, you know, Ephesus is here, Laodicea is here, well, Colossae was just a little south east, I guess it would be, of La Laodicea. It'd be east of Ephesus. If you look at a world map, you're going to see Israel, Syria, Turkey on today's map. Go to the left side of Turkey. Be, you know, I'm looking at the map this way. So left side of Turkey over towards Italy and Greece further. That shoreline. That's Ephesus, Laodicea, Colossae in modern-day Turkey. The Lycus River flows right through Colossae. It's, Colossae straddled the Lycus River. So if you're in Colossae, right there in modern-day Turkey, and you were to look up at the mountain range north, you're going to see Mount Cadmus, 8,000-foot mountain, right in the background. That's the lay of the land. The land was very fertile. All the nutrients coming off that mountain and, and that river, they had good water, they had good land. Big flocks. 
just keep that little tidbit in your head for a few minutes that we're going to get to in a few minutes. And who were the people that lived there? Well, if I asked you who the people were that lived there, you'd probably say they were all Gentile. But that's not, that's not entirely true. They were mostly Gentile. But there was a large Jewish population there. And you, you don't necessarily get this from reading the book of Colossians, but if you see what Josephus wrote about it, and a little bit of the Jewish history, when you go back to the book of Daniel, and there was a captivity of Jewish people taken to Babylon, which was further east of Colossae, Antiochus the Great, approximately 135 8 BC, transplanted 2,000 Jewish families into this region. Not Antiochus Epiphanes. This was, I think, his father. I think it's his father. I don't think it's his grandfather. Um, but he took 2,000 Jewish families from Babylon that were taken there captive years before and transplanted them in this region. So you have Gentiles. Remember, just to the east, or to, just to the west is is Ephesus and Greece. So th think about the influence that Ephesus and Greece had on Colossae and the people there. Their religion, their pagan religion, their, um, all their gods, even to the unknown god, right? You read in the book of Acts. And then you take that, you had this Jewish population, and how large it was by this point in time, I'm not 100% sure. So you had that, and then you had Jew, Jewish people there that would have had, you know, the law, the, all the, the works of the law. And then you had this church in Colossae, with these New Testament believers that are saved individuals assembled together in this church. It's no different than us today. You know, if I look out here among you all, I mean, you're all from different places and you have different histories and you've came from different religions. Some of you are second and third generation Christians, which in and of itself can be a good or bad thing. I don't know if, you know, all I really can compare it to is what America is like. Was there animosity in these Jewish people's lives? towards these, some of these people, the Babylonians, and the, for their captivity, for how they were treated, for the, the transplantation. I, I, I don't know. All I know is when I go to Tennessee and meet a real redneck, that was 150 years ago, 160 years ago. They're still fighting the Civil War sometimes. They don't necessarily um, like slavery but they don't not, they don't like yankees so there could have been a lot of things going on there just like there is going on in america that's just one example we got people in this church made up from all over we got people that came my wife was a roman catholic uncle john roman catholic mark methodist you know, and Roman Catholic. Roman Catholic. Yeah. yeah. And then you became Methodist? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of things going on. And, and lest we think that that Church of Colossae was different than what we are today, it, it's not. Maybe in one way or the other, but the whole thing is the same. And 
what Paul is trying to straighten out here is some of these, these things that kept popping its head up in the church. Same thing happens today. Well, what threatened the purity of the Colossian church? What threatened it? Well, the same thing that threatens the purity of Shalom Baptist Church. The exact same thing. In fact, Paul talks about it in Colossians chapter 2, verses 8, 16, and 18. And let, let me just skip ahead to that section for a moment before we come back. But in, in Colossians chapter 2, verses 8, 16, and 18, this is what he says. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Let no man therefore judge you in meat, or in drink, or in respect of a holy day, or of a new moon, or of the Sabbath days. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. Well, we don't do the same things that they did back then. I mean, they were worshiping angels. Come on. Really? People still worship angels. They make TV shows about them. People worship sports players. People worship their entertainment. Fill in the blank. It's the same scenario. We just dress it up with a different suit. That's all we do. I think I see a bear coming, just so you know. I thought it was interesting because I, I had taught this lesson at our former church. And I, I kept the notes. The lesson didn't change because I found the notes this morning, <laughs> which is a good thing. In that little section, it says, beware lest any man spoil you. Here's my bear, okay? That word spoil, when you read it, does not mean you have a, you know, don't spoil your child. I want ice cream every night for supper. Okay, Susie. If you leave your milk too long on the counter, it'll come out in big chunks. Spoil. That's not the word. Spoil is more of a wartime term or, or robbing term in this verse. It means to rob, and even rob them of the truth. For example, if I can get someone to believe a lie, I will rob them of the truth. I don't remember the verse. I want to say... I want to say it's a Mark and Matthew, but you can find it real easy. Just punch in the word spoil. It says, before you, well, I'm going to paraphrase, before you can spoil the strong man's house, you have to bind the strong man. That's the term. You're going to go in and take everything he has. You're going to rob him. You're going to even could take his life. All these things. Th think about in the war, when I talk about the spoils of war, what happened? 
So my notes from, I don't know how many years ago, 15 years ago, maybe? Beware lest any man spoil you. Do you know, it, the interesting thing about having an online Bible is you can punch in a verse and you can see that verse in every version there is known to man <laughs> at the click of a button. So you punch in this verse, and then you punch in you know, all the different translations that all say they have it correct, more you know, along with the Greek and the Hebrew, You get nine, nine say spoil, 18 say capture, two say enslave, three say rob, two say cheat, one says predator make you his prey, one says drag you off. Things that are different are not the same. But Tim, and this was what was going on, which is why I made it in my notes 15 years ago. But Tim, the new King James just puts it in modern language. And it takes out the these and the thous. Really? Because the new King James is one of the two that takes the word spoil out and puts in cheat. But when I read the word spoil, and I read the word cheat, it's two completely different scenarios that come to my mind. No, they didn't just change the these and the thous. They took the word spoil out and put in cheat. Why don't you trust it? Because it's copyrighted. And they're making millions and millions of dollars off it. In my 12th grade education, and my baloney detector goes off whenever I, I hear stuff like that. You have to change so many words to get a copyright. This is not copyrighted. It's not copyrighted. To me, that says something. Cheat is not the word. It's not the word. If I play a card game and somebody cheats, like the Mills, <laughs> the pastor always says, you know, I, mean, I don't know if they play card games or not, I've just said that, but I just laugh every time he says, I don't play with games with my family because they all cheat. <laughs> that is a whole different scenario than spoil. Just saying. That was 15 years ago. Spoil means to rob. Just think of the atrocities that happen when an incoming army would spoil you. This word philosophy, the lure of wisdom, theories, and the meaning of life. You know, the Bible says, beware. Lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. The lore of wisdom, theories, the meaning of life, vain deceit, empty, vain, it's empty, deceit. Combine those two, worthless deception. Beware. 
If you don't think this stuff is going on in 2021, you're an ostrich. Just saying. I would submit to you that it's going on more in 2021 than it was back in the days of Colossae. Why do I say that? Because you didn't have these, <laughs> right? You didn't have radio. You didn't have television. You, didn't, you don't have all these places you can get information from. You had this. You had the Old Testament writings. You had the disciples and the apostles. You had Jesus Christ himself. As far as we know, Paul never visited Colossae, even though he was at Ephesus. I can't prove to you that he ever went to Colossae, so I, I'm assuming that he didn't, but he, he wrote to them. We do know that Paul was in Ephesus for two years, which would have been just to the west. Most likely, some believers had carried the gospel from Ephesus to Colossae and introduced a number of Colossians to the Savior. Most likely, not only did that happen, they also spoke of who Paul was and his conversion experience and what he was doing. And he had an actual encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. Most likely, they heard the word of God. It's more than most likely. If you turn to Acts chapter 19, verses 1 and verse 10, in Acts chapter 19, this is what it says. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples. Now I'll skip the next couple of verses. Get to verse 10 and it says, and this continued by the space of two years. And here's the important sentence. So that all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. How did the people at Colossae hear because Paul was in Ephesus for two years. Believers were going, carrying the gospel, trade routes. They heard the word of God. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You see, the streams of living water, not just the physical water, Streams of living water had reached Colossae, along with the green pastures that, you know, lead you beside the still waters and, you know, the green pastures. And not only was, did the living water come, but there was good grass for these people to eat, to nourish them. I'm talking spiritually now. Here was the problem that Paul was going to deal with. People were trying to pollute the stream. And people were trying to poison the grass. Listen, you can eat corn that's sprayed with Roundup. It ain't going to hurt your gut. Sure. Tastes good. <laughs> Big ears. They were poisoning the grass and polluting the water. Well, who wrote the book of Coloss uh, Colossians? Easy to know. Paul says right in the first verse, go back to Colossians chapter 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Timotheus, our brother, 
It makes me mad. Some things make me mad easy. But it makes me mad when I try to find out information and you get one really smart person that says, well, Paul wrote this in AD 60. And then you get another really smart person that says, well, we think it was 61. And you get another really smart person that says, well, most likely it was 63. It makes me mad. Just saying. So I'll tell you, it was written sometime between 60 and 63. I don't know the exact date. It's right in that, that range. You get an idea. While, this is what we know, he was, it was while he was a prisoner in Rome. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Tim Timotheus, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul used his prison time to write a letter to the Colossians and encourage them to worship and serve Christ as God's Son, their Redeemer, the preeminent Lord of the universe, and as head of the church. That story does not change for Shalom Baptist Church. We should be doing the same thing. Colossians if you just skip down a few verses, Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 through 18, says, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his here dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Paul is setting the stage, the platform for them. All this erroneous teaching and mixed up teaching and philosophies and vain deceits and all these things were, were around and infiltrating. And he tells them in this little section right here, look, at, here's where you are. Here's where you came from. Here it is who you have believed in. This is the truth. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the image of his dear son. This is another word. I think translated is a great word here. That's where a lot of the other versions get it wrong. You see, some of the other versions say moved from, conveyed, transferred. And very few keep the word translated. Again, why? Because they only change the these and the thous. And the word translated is really hard to understand, you know. So we'll just put a word in there that changes the meaning. That sounds like a great idea. Listen, I wasn't just moved from the power of darkness to the kingdom of God's dear son. I was a child of darkness. I was caged in by the gates of hell. The devil, Satan, was my father. I had eternal punishment as my end. That wasn't my state when I was sent down the conveyor belt to a new location. I was translated. 
I was washed. I was given an adoption. I was given a new life. I was given a new heart. I was given a new destination. I was given a new father. I wasn't just moved from one place to the other. I'm not the same person or the, have the same um, characteristics. You know, like, um, not just like physical characteristics, but, you know, I was a child of darkness, I'm a child of light. My, I'm different. The caterpillar is a caterpillar. But when he goes through metamorphosis, he becomes a butterfly. He's still that caterpillar, but he's got a whole new beauty and a whole new view change. And a whole new diet. We have re in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Goes right back to that Old Testament sacrificial system the picture that Christ fulfilled. We have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Don't ever forget the blood of Jesus, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. You see, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are invisible. When you read Genesis chapter 1, invisible. The Bible says they're invisible. I can't remember exactly where, but it says it somewhere. Again, real easy to find in today's technology. But when you come to the book of John... And it says, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. The invisible God became visible. Thankfully. These are all things that the Colossian church needed to know to fight this false teaching. This is what the Holy Spirit told Paul to write down. Here's what you were. Here's what you have become. Here's, here's what gave you that. Here's what God is like. Here's the things he did, for by him were all things created. It wasn't your mythology from a country over. It, it wasn't today evolution and the Big Bang and you know, you got churches now adopting various forms of this stuff. Well, yeah, we, we believe the Bible, but there was probably a gap in there. There's probably millions of years in there. There was probably all for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. This is who he is. He is before all things. He's eternal. You people need to know that. It's eternal. We need to know it. They needed to know it. It helps us fight off these vain philosophies and these things that come into the church. He's the head of the body, the church. But he, let me, 
He says, by him all things consist. You, you know, if, if he ever took his hand off the earth, your just molecules would just fly apart. He holds everything together. He keeps the water where it belongs. He keep, I mean, he, everything consists by him. Can, can you imagine if he let his hand off and we didn't have gravity anymore? We didn't have the right oxygen mix or whatever? I mean, it, by him all things consist. He's the head of the body, the church. Who is the head? It didn't change from the church in Colossae to 2021, the church in Shalom Baptist Church. Christ is the head. Don't ever forget that. He, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. He needs to be the focus of our existence. Every time we get together, Christ should be the focus. Christ should be the one who is exalted and lifted up. That's our purpose. That's, when you read down through that section, all these different things, th this is why we're here. If, if, we're not, if that isn't true and that isn't our focus, we might as well just go play frisbee be, be golf with the hundred other people that are down there. If this isn't true, we might as well go play frisbee golf. I'll end here. He, the Apostle Paul wanted them to understand that they were complete in him. Colossians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10 say, For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. A lot of times we read over that. that that's a power packing verse right there. Oh, no, when Christ came, you know, he didn't have all the, he didn't have all that. I don't know. My 11 and a half years in high school say, for in him, Jesus, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. We're complete in Jesus Christ. Everything that we have everything that we need, everything that we will ever become, he's given us all that we need to fulfill his purpose in our life. We're complete. We don't need anything else. We don't need these vain philosophies, these philosophies and vain deceits and all these different things. No, here's what we need. We need an understanding of the word of God. That's what we need. Then we need to apply the word of God to our lives with that understanding, that's the problem that was going on in the Church of Colossae. This is all background. We'll get to verse one and a half, one half, and verse two next week. But the story is the same in 2021 as it was then. Remember that. Same thing's going on, just dressed up different. Beware. Beware, it says. Father, we again, we thank you for this morning. Lord, we think of those that are not able to be with us this morning. Lord, I pray that you would put your healing hand on them this morning, Lord, and that you would help them. We think of Kevin and Titus and Dennis and Donna and Lord, these ones that are bat battling different, different things, Lord, in their bodies. And Lord, especially for Titus and Kevin, Lord, I pray that you'd give the people taking care of them real understanding of what's going on. I pray that you, as the great physician, would just heal their bodies, Lord, and restore them to health and strength. And Lord, if that be your will, that would be what we would ask. Lord, I pray that you'd strengthen the church. I pray that you'd take this word. You'd help us to beware in 2021, just like you told the church of Colossae to beware all those years ago.